All right, well, it's, um, it's a few minutes after here. So um, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, welcome to the uh, first NDSA infrastructure interest group call for 2022. And it um, looks like we've got a, a good group of folks uh, joining. So, um, and I'm glad everyone remembered to join. It's a week, a week later than we normally meet. Uh, so we'll talk about schedule also a little bit later. Um, let's see, I will go ahead and um, post the link in the chat one more time for people who just joined. Um, so we have a, a few things we wanna uh, cover. I think this is going to be a little bit more of a planning meeting um, now that uh, we have more, uh, more members who are joining and um, We'll spend some time talking uh, about uh, a discussion topics poll that we set up, and um, we'll also talk about the uh, some scheduling ideas uh, that uh, the NDSA leadership has recently uh, settled on for the interest groups. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to also record some more ideas on that poll, and um, also talk about. Uh, perhaps the, uh, the um, uh, I guess you could say implementation of, um, or just using, using themes for our uh, discussions across the interest groups, the NDSA interest groups. And I think that should be pretty much, pretty much it for this particular meeting. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll have, based on the new schedule, we'll also, um, uh, maybe we can get an idea of what our um, most uh, voted for topic would be to talk about first, and um, we can get to work on trying to figure out how that will uh, either, you know, what will be, be lining up for an agenda for that meeting, uh, if anybody will be, um, you know, uh, asked to try to share information um, at that meeting on a particular topic, that sort of thing. So, um, Let's see. Let's see a lot of the usual, usual folks who are here. Um, Scott, since you're the the uh, new person, um, would you mind um, just giving us a brief intro? Sure. Uh, I'm Scott Prater. I'm a digital library architect at uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. It's actually kind of funny how I ended up here. I thought that we were members of NDSA, and. Nathan sent a thing, please make sure to update your membership. And I couldn't, I logged in, I couldn't see us. Turns out we weren't. And so <laughs> I uh, talked with some of my colleagues and uh, UW-Madison uh, became members about a month or so ago. And at that point, uh, I volunteered to serve on the infrastructure group. Um, I've done a lot with uh, digital library infrastructures over the course of my career. Um, in the past uh, four or five years, I've uh, been doing a lot with developing the uh, digital preservation infrastructure at uh, UW-Madison, and I work um, with BTAA also, hi Carol, on, uh, digital, preser on digital preservation topics and uh, things like that. So yeah, that's a brief, brief bio. Great, thanks for, thanks for being the intro and welcome. Glad you know Carol too. So um, I also saw that you had added a couple things to the poll there. Uh, so let's, we can chat about that too. Um, so what I think what I think I'll do is I'll go ahead and um, share up my screen so we can take a look at uh, the topics poll, and we'll go from there. All right. Uh, can everyone see my screen okay? Could you do a refresh? Oh, sorry. Um, Eric, could you do a refresh? Because I think I voted since you. Yeah, we had several more no. votes come in. Uh, uh, let's see. Sure. Let's do this again. Uh, hang on.
Okay, is that, is that working? Yeah, it's okay. We can see it. It's just it doesn't have all the votes that are out there right now. Yeah, I voted and they're not showing up. So yeah, okay. so if you just hit enter again up in the bar at the top, would yeah, would that refresh it? There yeah, yeah. Go. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, it's just uh I think an audio issue on my part too. Great, thanks. All right. So yeah, traditionally, um, I, I don't know if I could say traditionally, but at least in the past couple of years, um, we have lined up this uh, sort of just discussion topics poll for the interest group. And um, I think Nathan had actually started it uh, back in 2018, um, maybe 2019. So uh, this is a way we've been kind of deciding on different topics. And um, I added a few earlier on. Uh, Scott, it looks like uh, calculating costs for redundant storage uh, has now been voted on a lot too. The geographic distribution and cloud environments. Um, those are our top two right now. Uh, OCFL is out there. We actually had a conversation about OCFL last year. Uh, one of the um, leads in the OCFL communi uh, community came and talked um, about just the specification itself, um, but it's been out there for uh, a little bit longer now, and um, that's kind of kind of why I put it back out there. Um, just in terms of finding out how the adoption and uptake of a CFL has been going, might be interested. Um, interesting to do that. Um, remote library services. Um, that's just with regard to the impact on uh, library services in general, but more specifically, like how has that affected digital preservation related efforts? Um, you know, you can think about, uh, you know, digitization and scanning efforts, and then, uh, you know, who's been impacted on, or in terms of like their bandwidth with regard to actually moving that information, getting all the metadata together, getting it ready for digital preservation purposes, that sort of thing. Um, and then the other topic that I put down there is the intersection of um, AI, DEI, and digital preservation. Um, I think there's been a, uh, you know, just a lot of discussion with regard to ethics and machine learning uh, and DEI, and you know, what is the, is there a crossroad? Is there an intersection there um, where we could actually find? Uh, for example, some selections to to read, some um, you know maybe take that sort of uh, digital preservation book club type approach that we took with one of our meetings last year. Um, you know, could we could we go go through and find um, publications and information that would be interesting to kind of like dissect and come back to the group and discuss. So. Um, those are the topics we've got out there right now and. Uh, I, you know, I think the uh, probably probably appropriate time to kind of bring up the the notion of the schedule changes um, that the NDSA leadership has been talking about uh, with regard to the interest groups. So we have uh, we've got five things here, um, but one of the you know one of the the things that we're going to be putting into place for the interest groups is actually scheduling instead of once a month uh, for every each one of the three interest groups, we're going to be scheduling out on a quarterly basis. Uh, so that means there will be one interest group uh, meeting per month um, and we'll basically rotate uh, throughout the quarter. So um, for us, for the infrastructure interest group, what we'd be looking at is our next meeting would be March and then June, September and December after that. Um, So if we, let's see, it's fresh in some time. Um, I think it'd be great to uh, to kind of decide on uh, what folks would like to try to talk about in March. Um, we could probably go with one of our two top contenders here, um, calculating costs for redundant storage and geographic distribution. Um, I would encourage folks to go ahead and add more topics as we you know go throughout the year i can change the the deadline for um this particular 
uh, poll. We can extend it for as much as, uh, you know, for another month if that works, um, that sort of thing. So um, do folks have any questions with regard to the intended schedule change? Um, we just put that out there first. Eric, I was wondering if it would be worth mentioning um, that one side benefit to the new schedule is that people would have an opportunity to maybe uh, drop in on other interest group meetings. Right. Yeah, that's that's part of the part of the intention too. Is that um, you know sometimes if like if you're interested in more than one of the groups going to two or three meetings per month might be a little much. So um, that's why we're trying to uh, kind of scale it back to one per month. And um, by the way, sorry, sorry earlier um, about the whole refresh thing. Um, Michelle, thanks for dropping that note in there. So I think it, it, um, it'll probably be up to Robin and I to see what we can do in terms of um, uh, either drumming up folks who want to talk about both calculating costs for storage and also geographic distribution. Um, well, we may also uh, take the approach of different meeting styles. Um, last year, we, we had a few different meeting styles. We had this sort of kind of open discussion. We had a uh, solution room type meeting style where um, anybody can bring in a particular challenge that they're having uh, at their institution, at their organization. Um, and we kind of like put that front and center uh, to talk about for a certain amount of time during the meeting. Um, this, the, uh, the reading club approach I just mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, trying to find selections uh, to read about or videos to watch with regard to a particular topic, we might go that route too. Um, and then, of course, having a speaker uh, come in and talk to the group uh, about a particular topic. So we could go any one of those routes for these two um, top contenders here. And then uh, maybe also maybe consider OCFL. I could reach back out to Andrew about that. Um, so Andrew Woods was the person who came to talk to us last year about OCFL. So let's see. Back here. I think the, you know, the other uh, thing we should probably chat about is the, as I mentioned earlier, is the notion of themes across these discussions. Um, I kind of, it, it's, you know, not something we've decided to formally pick up or anything like that, but. Uh, I kind of put out these few ideas here um, about different quote unquote themes. Um, you know, should we, because the, the interest groups are actually going to be rotating over the course of uh, the quarter, um, do folks think it would be beneficial to uh, um, just home in on a particular topic or a particular kind of, or, have our discussions all fall under a single umbrella, um, you know, like, for example, like applying the levels of preservation um, to an existing preservation program or um, dealing with sensitive information um, or just establishing a brand new program. I think, you know, the, the different topics we're, we're interested in right now uh, could fall under at least a couple of those, those themes. Uh, certainly just establishing a new program. Um, does anybody have input on, on those ideas? Like actually having a theme? I can, yeah, um, is, uh, Scott, so I guess I have a question. Um, with the discussion and kind of the role of the interest group at large, is the idea that we would uh, like create some sort of deliverable out of the discussions, like a white paper or a best practices doc or something like that? Or is it more an interest group discussion for kind of mutual support and discussion of um, 
the topics we're interested in and the problems we're facing or a mix of both? I guess, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, yeah, the, um, in general, the working groups at NDSA are uh, the places where deliverables are, are you know, put together and assembled. So um, we would be more or less having a discussion about any of these topics and recording information. Um, so uh, I was going to say, Car Carol, could I put you on the on the spot and maybe ask you to talk a little bit more about like the differences between the the working groups and the interest groups? If not, I can keep going. Sure, I just had to find my unmute button. <laughs> um, yeah, so the interest groups and working groups have always been interesting <laughs> in terms of trying to figure out who does what. Um, and let's see, sorry, we'll do that too for you. Um, so the interest groups used to be called working groups and we changed them to be interest groups to be more kind of the place to come and talk, to share um, what you've been working on, to talk about concerns and issues and just kind of to be a more <clears throat> open forum. And then depending on the interest group, um, the formats of those would be different. So like what um, Eric was talking about before, whether it was like an open forum or whether you know there was a speaker that was coming to talk about a topic. Um, so the format of those interest groups could be different. Um, but the working groups are the groups that actually have deliverables. So all of the surveys that we've asked you all to fill out um, are all working groups. So the staffing survey, the fixity survey, um, the levels of preservation, all of those have been working groups where there's a deliverable. Um, and then the working groups kind of spin up and spin down depending on um, what their function is. So, um, you know, the survey groups have a schedule now of, you know, three, two to three years um, spinning up and down. Um, so does that, does that help Scott and everybody else to kind of give a little bit more background? Um, yeah, that is helpful to me. Thank you. Okay. And another thing I'd say too is there's always been some um, questions too about if a if an interest group does do something that they want to share and that they have created, there's nothing saying that they can't. Um, so like the standards and practices group um, has created some things. They haven't been published yet, but we're trying to figure out a way to share those materials with other people. Um, so. There's nothing saying that the interest groups can't work on a project together either. So yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, yep. there's definitely no, no barrier there. So Eric, to, to, to talk about your question about themes, I mm -hmm. think the concept is great. I, I like the idea, but I would hate to be so uh, wedded to themes that things that are really specifically an infrastructure topic that really doesn't fit under the themes that we we wouldn't try to cover it. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely um, kind of go either way there, try to be flexible. I, yeah, I, there's, there's the downside of, of you know, I mean, I, we definitely wouldn't want to, well, there's no point in locking ourselves into a theme if it's not going to be beneficial and, um, you know, infrastructure uh, related topics can, can definitely kind of get into uh, a different space um, versus standards and practices or content. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it's, and this is that's great feedback. So um, uh, definitely, if, if there's, you know, I can take that kind of feedback uh, back to the rest of the, the co-chairs for, or we can, you know, Robin and I can do that. Um, and okay, thanks, Carol, for adding that note in the chat. So. Um, 
In any case, all right. So yeah, if people have any other ideas about kind of, uh, of, of any kind of themes or uh, whether or not they'd, they'd wanna try to pick those up or not, um, any kind of opinions, that's, you know, please go ahead and add them in the, the running notes doc here, it's all good. Um, and uh, Carol, yeah, your note, Eric may have a better answer. The groups are working on the schedules. I haven't heard anything about the switching times. Yeah, I have not heard anything about uh, changing the actual meeting times either. Um, I think we would just rotate through on a quarterly basis on our usual days during the month. Um, so why don't we go back to, let's see. Let me go back to talking about calculating costs and also geographic distribution of um, in cloud environments. Um, so with regard to uh, calculating costs for redundant storage, um, yeah, how could we actually, like what are the, the, the details that we really wanna discuss there? And then I could, uh, Scott, if you want to chime in on that, I can, I can definitely chat about uh, the geographic distribution and cloud environments part. Maybe we can get a better idea of what uh, these discussions would involve. Sure. So the um, reason I brought that up is because we just, I just went through this, um, uh, this exercise last, um, last fall, and it ended up taking quite a bit longer than I thought, but the output was pretty good. So I was asked in relation to a grant project to calculate how much storage we're using, how much storage we think we're going to use and what are the costs. And it turned out that we're using a local uh, storage on a NAS that is, um, uh, that is maintained by University of Wisconsin. And then we're putting things also in uh, AWS in the cloud and how many copies there actually were is not a simple answer. And how we are charged for those copies wasn't a simple answer either. So what I ended up doing was creating a wiki page with some tables that just basically had all the locations with all the copies, whether they were being backed up or not, what the cost was for the storage tier, what the cost was for the backup of anything. And then doing a similar uh, exercise with AWS, which is also not the simplest thing in the world to kind of calculate and project costs, especially when you're talking about egress and metadata on blobs and things like that. So it occurred to me that this might be a useful thing to discuss. I'd be happy to share my experience and the documentation I came up with and walk through it. But I'd like to hear how others calculate costs too, because I, I'd say the question in my institution comes up um, about twice a year, if not more often. Scott, how much is it costing us to do digital preservation for storage? And I have to come back and say, let me get back to you on that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and we, we've definitely uh, encountered that at, uh, at CDL as well. Um, in fact, uh, our finance team just recently asked me to um, record some just projections and ideas about you know what we're going to be using based on the amount of content that's coming into our system, um, the rate of that you know that we can only somewhat predict based on you know the past few years. Not always a great prediction that sort of thing, and then all the all the uh, you know as you're, as you're saying they kind of like difficult to chase down. Uh, costs associated with you know cloud storage, whether it's AWS or compute or egress or you know like S3 charges, um, and and they vary right across different uh, cloud service providers too. Um, so there's yeah there's definitely a lot to a lot to dig in there. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd be. Um, and Martha just mentioned I should be receiving an AWS report for deep freeze storage. Oh, okay, um, you know we could uh, we could collaborate and uh, each put together a few slides uh, um, or some information to talk about. If you want to try to work on that for March, and yeah, it sounds good to me. Um, Martha, would would you be up for contributing as well?
Uh, you're muted, Martha. I think. Sorry. Um, I only do the uh, free storage for the uh, digital collections, uh, which doesn't have the additional components for digital preservation. But I think it's, it's worth um, researching, you know, and sharing with you. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, um, we, in fact, okay, uh, it's a few years ago. Oh, Leah mentioned it's a few years ago, but when we were trying to get numbers from Google, even the engineers can figure it out, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, let's, yeah, uh, I would be happy to start up uh, an email thread and maybe what we can do uh, also a Google Doc and we can just uh, create an outline and see what we could each uh, contribute in terms of the discussion. That sounds to uh, be a good way to go. Yeah, for um, when I say for us, uh, TDL, just a couple of other details there. Um, we were using S3 for some collections as primary storage. We're using Wasabi as, uh, you know, copy um, to add copies to uh, for different objects or different collections. And then we've got uh, SDSC, the San Diego Supercomputer Center that we actually have the primary copy for the majority of the content in our system. And they all, and then there are these interesting agreements that go between AWS uh, at the UC level and you know whether or not we get credits for shuttling data around between STSC and Oregon. And uh, it gets kind of really, really dicey there uh, trying to feed. I mean, we basically see what comes out of that at the end of each month. Um, so yeah, I'll try to dig up some more information about that's sort of those sort of transactions. Um, yeah, and one thing that made it especially complicated is that we've never actually seen a bill from Google or from Central IT that our uh, our AWS storage. I'm sorry, not Google, but AWS is a um, can, is a institutional contract that's uh, managed through Central IT. And theoretically, we're being charged for it, but we've never gotten a bill. And we're not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> but Come trying on. to calculate the ca cost makes that even trickier when I have no bill that I can look at to compare bytes on disk to amount we're being charged. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, well yeah, that, that doesn't make it challenging at all. <laughs> So, okay, um, well, this, yeah, this is great. I really appreciate everybody kind of tripping in. Uh, so let's plan something out for, for March that way. Uh, like I said, I'll send out an email and also start up a, a Google talk for people to contribute to. Um, and I'll, I'll post that, um, you know, I'll, just, I'll send those to the entire group. So if anybody uh, uh, wants to contribute, please do. And all righty. So the other, uh, the other topic uh, about geographic distribution in cloud environments, I mean, uh, the note that I'd added there uh, in the poll was considered distribution in terms of policy standards and content. Um, there is part of the reason I'm always thinking about this uh, is that I think uh, it was Stephen Abrams over at Harvard who uh, gave a talk at uh, either DigiPres or um, another conference a while ago. He shared information about how they, um, based on the type of content going into their preservation system, how they intend to tag it and um, what those tags mean based on the type of content and if it's, for example, uh, special collections content, then where does the system send copies or replicate to in the cloud based on that specific kind of content? Um, if it's sensitive information for data sets, uh, does it even get to the cloud? It usually stays in on-prem storage. Uh, what does access to that storage look like? Um, and then there's a mix. Um, and you know, they, it could involve, I think for their system, it can involve cloud storage, it could involve um, things like, uh, you know, nearline Amazon like Glacier or uh, Glacier Deep Archive. Um, and then I think they had tape backups in the mix as well. So this idea of, you know, how do you distribute uh, 
across cloud environments, not only for the type of content, but then like geographic distribution, uh, how does that play into it? Um, you know, the notion of making sure you're trying to mitigate risk the best you, you can with different disaster threats across different geographic regions. Um, that's it's just, you know, one of those, I think it's one of those conversations that it has some basic guidance uh, or I guess just basic nuts and bolts uh, to the equation. Um, we could also bring the levels of preservation into that. Uh, but when you're actually applying the concepts, those like kind of straightforward concepts, it can, it can get complicated. So that's where that conversation um, could, um, could pick up. So um, that would be, if, uh, considering the schedule, that would be out in June. Um, we could, you know, let, let's just keep our, kind of keep our options open there. Um, you know, we could we could either do some research, we could find some selections to read, uh, have an open discussion, uh, that sort of thing. But yeah, let's we'll try to figure out how to approach that. So, anybody else have thoughts on um, geographic distribution uh, across different cloud environments? Uh, just to chime in. We might also want to look at um, like the maps of risk mm -hmm. and how those vary across uh, different areas. Yeah. Because if you're part of a consortia, the risk that, let's say, a school around Atlanta might be different from the geographic risk of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, um, you know, you could, you could think of it across geographies and then we could also bring in, um, you know, the notion of different, uh, you know, uh, storage regions with AWS, for example, you know, it's like, what do you, what do you end up facing in terms of costs for distributing your data across regions that way? Um, you know, we've, we've thought. In the past, we've thought about trying to distribute a copy of our content overseas to Europe because Wasabi has another data center over there. <laughs> um, but, you know, timing, performance, uh, cross region costs, all those sorts of things suddenly kind of rise to the surface. And, you know, even though it sounds like a good idea, it might be very impractical, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, considering like, the different um, specific impacts of particular regions that would be interesting to talk about also. Um, Plus in that case, there would also be legal, which is always a tough thing to crack. If you're looking at the different policies within different countries. Right, right. Yeah, because then you've uh, then you've got anything from, um, yeah, uh, hmm. yeah, cross country reach across right, and it's like in terms of takedown requests, um, in terms of um, intellectual property. Yeah. Well. All right. You know, there's um, one other thing related to cost of storage um, that I can think of, which is uh, basically the effort that it takes to get something in or out of different types of clouds. Uh, at Cornell, we do a lot of roll your own type of things. And so but this requires when we're engaging something like Azure that we roll our own kind of mechanism to get something in and out of that. And that's, that's not a trivial thing because we have to take developer time aside, train them up in Microsoft stuff um, when they're used to working with AWS and, and uh, you know, engage the way permissions work very differently and the way roles inside the machine work very differently in order to just get the stuff in there. So 
Um, it's uh, it's sometimes a hidden cost, but I think it's worth talking about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the there's a, a interesting example we ran up against uh, recently is um, just talk about the the cost of development and also uh, just learning um, new uh, hardware and um, you know how that interacts with like AWS or otherwise. Like we were recently working with UCLA and a museum from overseas. Um, and they ended up sending us hard drives. And what we ended up doing was actually transferring that content to AWS uh, snow cones uh, and then setting up the snow cones so they would eventually trans transfer all their data into a particular S3 bucket. And that whole process was a learning process. Um, and it took a lot of time. It didn't take an exorbitant amount of time, but it definitely took time. Um, so, Right. Uh, examples like that would be really interested, interesting to talk about. Um, and again, any of the costs associated with them. And then, you know, now moving for, the, for, for that example, now moving the, that content from an S3 bucket, having it configured such that it can ingest with all the right metadata entire system, that's a whole nother like developer project for us. Um, so there are like thousands of images, there are going to be thousands of metadata files. Uh, bringing all those together in an automated fashion. Yeah, that's that's more time for us too. More time, more yeah, cost. Right, and and we balance this with this need for, um, for be, lack of a better term, for the need for com commercial diversity, right? So we don't wanna put all our eggs in one bucket in terms of where we put data because of environmental threats. And we certainly don't wanna put all our eggs in one bucket with one vendor. Like, let's just use Amazon because, you know, there are, threats there as well. So, you know, when we're putting up diverse clouds, we have to engage diverse architectures and that can be really interesting and costly. Right, right. So let's see, I just wanna make sure I copy down some of these. Oh, that's, I've been taking some notes just uh, locally here. I'll add them to the running notes talk shortly. Um, So, okay, um, that sounds like something we could uh, also pull together some uh, interesting examples from the group to talk about uh, probably out in June, but um, but I think it'll be, you know, hmm. it was maybe, yeah, let's see, I'll, I'll see if, who we can reach out to also. Um, see if there are any reps from uh, different interest like cloud providers that might be interested in coming and talk to the group. Um, I know like a couple of years ago, actually some um, two representatives from Wasabi came to talk with the group. Um, I'm wondering if we could, and I'm sure like some, some people down at STSC might be open to doing so, but um, yeah, people do have contacts out um, either representatives they've worked with directly at cloud service providers who might be open to chatting with us, um, maybe give that some thought too. So, Eric, has um, Andrew Diamond ever talked to the group about the work he's done on a tool to ease getting content in and out of different cloud or different storage solutions? It's like basically enabling the end user to upload things. Okay, okay. I, I don't know if that's of interest in related to this or. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can definitely reach out to Andrew um, because there's, you know, it's the notion of uh, enabling uh, or just basic and also, you know, streamlining the process for end users to actually ingest content and move content around. Yeah, I think Andrew could talk to us about, uh, from their perspective, from AP Trust, 
like different policies about how stuff is distributed. They've got diversification of uh, commercial providers and also some end tools that people can use to upload content and set their policy, I think. So I don't know, here, Bradley, either one might be good people to have for part of the discussion. Okay. Uh, and give me a second here. Um, I've got some light coming in the window. I'm going to close the window shade. I'll be ready. That's better. Alrighty. And to let's see if we um, we can definitely reach out to Andrew Woods too with regard to OTFL. Um, and then I would also encourage people if uh, if there are notes that you want to add with regard to any of the topics on the poll, uh, please feel free to add those within the running notes document. Um, because of the, the schedule that we're going to um, adopt, we've definitely got time to think about um, what we want to chat about with regard to each topic. Yeah, thanks, Robin. I appreciate it. I can definitely say I am terrible at both leading a meeting and trying to take notes at the same time. It's virtually impossible for me. <laughs> um, I as well. Cool, thanks. Um, okay, so let's see. Great. So I think that is pretty much everything that we had on the agenda for today. Uh, we're about a quarter of. Thanks everyone for chiming in. Um, I put, uh, okay, I'll, I'll add some, like I said, I'll add some of my notes to the doc too. Um, is there anything else folks would like to, to chat about before we, uh, before we wrap up? I do. I, I think it's um, it's always interesting to go through a planning meeting and trying to figure out what we want to talk about for the rest of the year. <laughs> Thanks for uh, uh, for bringing some information to the table. We appreciate it. And also, um, if you do have any input with regard to the schedule, if you all do want to meet more frequently than you know once a quarter, we're completely open to that. Um, <clears throat> You know, the, the new schedule is, is more for organizational purposes, but uh, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, keeping the conversation going, uh, we're definitely open to meeting more frequently. Um, there's also, uh, oh, I think, let's see, um, and the NDSA recently in the last uh, leadership meeting, um, we talked about using Slack uh for communications between uh between meetings so um i'm going to check in with uh with carol and with nathan um but there are slack channels that have been set up um and i should be able to send out information about those channels and a general channel that you could join um oh okay so carol's carol said okay she hasn't set them up set them up yet there's not one for infrastructure probably so uh thanks carol appreciate it so yeah, we'll definitely um, get that information out to you all uh, by sending an email out to the group. Um, but that will be hopefully a great way for all of us to communicate uh, in between our meetings. Uh, anytime you've got thoughts about uh, what you wanna talk about or if you have questions or would like input from the group, just uh, it'll be a great, great way to post uh, through Slack, so. Yeah, and I'll just jump in there, Eric, too. Um... Yeah, we will send something out. Eric can send something out when we have <laughs> completed. And also, I think the plan was to keep a link um, so anybody can join at any time kind of on the running meeting notes. So it should be easy to join. 
Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, Rob, Robin, is there anything else you wanted to mention or for we wrap up? I don't think so. I can't think of anything else we had discussed to be on the agenda for this first meeting. I just hope people will add their thoughts to the document um, so that we can have a good plan in place for March. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, and I'll, um, let's see, we could, we could either, uh, how about, that's actually probably um, the right way to go is just to actually add our thoughts here for, um, we can make a section for March and we can out, all add our thoughts about, uh, you can discuss what when we get there. So yeah, let's, let's keep all those notes in the running notes document instead of making a separate Google Doc. Yeah, cool. Righty. Okay. Um, last call. I'll say if any does anybody have anything else to add. Uh, otherwise, I think we can call it good. Thanks. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks uh, sir. Bye. Appreciate okay. it. Take you care. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.